Hello Cruel Cruel World, my name is Dr. Shaham Das, I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. I'm going to do something a bit different in this video. It's about the case of Casey Anthony, whose daughter Kaylee uh, disappeared and was found dead under, let's say, pretty suspicious circumstances. And there's a very odd presentation, I think is the nicest way of putting it, about Casey, the mother, and the way that she interacted with the police, how she misled them, etc., etc. So this is like an analysis to clips from a recent documentary about Casey Anthony called Where the Truth Lies. So this analysis is in two parts. There's the part you're watching right now and part two, which is going to be on the analysis of the channel of Spidey, the behavioral arts. You can find the, the uh, description in the links below to all the parts. So Spidey, what can I say about this man? He is like the Canadian version of Darren Brown. He's a mentalist, hypnotist, very funny dude. He's actually uh, managed to fool Penn and Teller on a show before fooling Penn and Teller even became a thing. He's also got one of the biggest YouTube channels on the subject of behavioral analysis. He's got a degree in sociology, psycho psychology, has a certification in body language and criminal interrogation, and he teaches behavioral analysis and practical psychology on stage, TV shows all over the world. He's, he's a regular at the Montreal Comedy Festival, which is near his hood. Uh, and me and him will be going back and forth, we'll be giving our different perspectives, mine from the forensic psychiatrist, his from the behavioral analysis kind of perspective. So sit back, relax, enjoy this video, shout out to Spidey, and welcome to a Schmike for Schmorschmeinsch. So my psych for sore guys and gals, I'd like to welcome my man Spidey from the Behavioural Arts to the channel. Welcome oh. Spidey. What's up man? How you doing brother? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to look at some of these scenes with you because I have a lot of questions for you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for doing all the all the donkey work that I am too incompetent to do, all the editing from this uh, documentary. I think something was lost in translation there because in Canada that's not a... I don't appreciate being called a donkey. <laughs> well then, stop looking like a donkey, what can I tell you? Woo! All right, well, good luck with the editing. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> so you've, uh, you've helped cultivate some clips from this Casey Anthony documentary, Where the Truth Lies, um, and you very kindly ordered the the most interesting psychological clips. So let, let's see what you come up with and let's discuss. Sure. Let's go. I don't, think, I don't think she intentionally wanted to, but she should be in jail because of Kaylee not being here. I want to think he doesn't have the power to hurt me anymore, but he still does. And this was years ago. One of many that he and my mother did separately and together for money. For money throw me under the bus for money. Why? Why exploit this situation any more than it has been? So, um, isn't that the pot calling the kettle black? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It stinks of hypocrisy to me because she is doing exactly that, isn't she? She's, she's literally making a documentary trying to get her narrative, her version of events out which is obviously different from her father's and her parents. But, right, so basically, if everything she says is true, and we've discussed this in videos we've done on your channel, we can't 100% deny that it isn't, but on balance, a lot of things she said isn't true. If she, what she says is true, then you could think of it as him being guilty, him knowing he's guilty, and him going on Dr. Phil for money and to trash her name and to try and attack her and hurt her. But I think on balance, that is very, very unlikely. I believe that the truth is very blurred and he may have some kind of role, but he's certainly not as guilty as she's portraying. So to me, logically, he's just trying to answer questions that the general public want to know. He's trying to he's trying to uh, clear his own name, which which has been dragged through the mud by Casey, if it's not true. What do you think? Couldn't agree more. And And I would argue that First of all, I don't know for a fact if she's being paid for this documentary, but I would highly suspect she is. You know, Peacock is, is paying her something for this, is, is my assumption. No one's come out and said that, but it's got to be. Even that notwithstanding, uh, there was a big scandal back in the day where for hundreds of thousands of dollars, she sold pictures of Kaylee to ABC. So 
I would argue that anything that can defend her doing this documentary can defend him going on Dr. Phil. You know, she says, no, I'm just trying to get my truth out there because my name was slandered. Well, he could say the same. During the trial, his name was slandered and he's going out there to clear his name. And anything that she can accuse them of, they can accuse her of. And I wanted to ask you, can this be because in part two, which we analyzed on my channel last week, you talked a lot about narcissism. Is, that, is it possible that's what we're seeing here? That she can only see, even if it's the same behavior, because one benefits her and the other doesn't, that she sees one as this terrible thing, that they're doing this for money, but in her case doesn't apply because, because it, she's the victim. Yeah. So the answer to that is absolutely. There are lots of different traits of narcissism that we're seeing here. I'll go through some of them. Victimization is one. So believing that the whole world is kind of against you or that neutral or balanced situations like exactly what you talked about. The fact that he's going on to clear his name, she's going on to clear her name. Seemingly, she still puts herself as the victim in that quite equal scenario. And I think in part one of the videos we've done together, we talked about how Casey uh, spoke about me about her being against the world when she was in prison whereas her focus should have been where is my daughter because unless she knows something that we don't she still at that point thinks that her daughter's missing is possibly in danger but that's not her narrative or her speech it's all about how people aren't aren't helping me so that is victimization it's also um egocentrism so just being at the center of everything and that's almost the pure definition of a narcissist is that the whole world revolves around me and the final thing is entitlement so she feels entitled to potentially get money from documentaries or at least get the airtime to express her opinions whereas he doesn't so yeah all of those things absolutely screams narcissism to me I put my memories into boxes. It protected me, but also was holding me back from really dealing with things. In this process of some of those boxes, I had to forcibly pull down off of a shelf and unlock. And when I finally was able to start to explore each of them, no matter how painful or how hurtful, the gaps in my memory. It allowed me to work through some of that. But now, it's all been knocked around on the floor and I have to feel that, that deepest sorrow and I'm grieving all over again. So I have absolutely nothing to say here because there's no body language for me to analyze. We're not even seeing or we're seeing a graphic. I have some questions for you though, um, Dr. Dawes. You have interviewed hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe millions, maybe even billions of people uh, who gave testimony along these lines as to how they remember and how they're fragmented memories. Is this for you, and I legitimately don't have an answer to this, is this for you in line with what you've heard or is there an element of this that makes you go, oh, I have no idea, I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so first of all, it's probably a couple, a few hundred, probably not billions <laughs> of patients that I've assessed, both giving testimony in criminal trials and also that are victims of abuse, including um, abuse from childhood in my civil court cases. And one thing that I've learned is that the majority have fairly clear memories of what happened. That is by far the most common clinical presentation, especially if it happened in later childhood. You know, it's different if people were went through these traumatic experiences at very young ages, you know, two, three, four, I wouldn't say past four, but anybody that has them older than that, most of the time they they remember. Now, they, they might be slightly vague and might be slightly fragmented, but there's some memories. You get a small subset of people who have literally put those memories away in a box like Casey sta states that she has. So they've intentionally intentionally formed an emotional barrier, barrier to bury those memories. Uh, but I've never heard of anybody having both those presentations of having both fragmented and buried memories simultaneously because you can't, your memories are either there or they're not. They're either in the box or they're out. They can't be both. And even though she didn't talk about it in, in detail in this particular clip we've seen, you and I have talked in previous clips how she supposedly had all these memories coming flooding back in prison. Um, and I, I mean, she said in that clip that we just saw, I was, I was, I, I can't remember the exact words, but I forcibly had to pull the memories out. And I suppose that makes me question why she had to forcibly pull the memories out. I mean, it is a bit convenient, isn't it? Uh, and again, we've said this in other videos, I can't 
definitively say 100% that she's definitely lying, although she has lied about many things to the police. But it just seems a little bit unlikely to me on balance. It seems less likely that she would like she would choose to pull these memories out if there's no particular reason apart from that reason being the convenience for her narrative in the trial. So that's what I would say. Amazing. Thank you. And I do want to reiterate something that, again, we said in the other video, but it's really important. So let's say it again very clearly. Neither of us want to be the person who doubts someone's abuse story. We're just applying the knowledge that she's lied about a lot of stuff to look at stuff. But we're just talking about behaviors and patterns. Neither of us is saying, no, this didn't happen. Very important. When we talk to the psychologists who deal with people who've been abused from a small age by a parent, they describe a child that results who has the ability to go into these compartmentalized worlds and they can lock up the knowledge of one world, one reality, and move into another. They compartmentalize to the point where they seem like a compulsive liar. Compulsive liar. <sighs> that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Ah, this guy. I love <laughs> this guy. Uh, we talked about this guy on my video. So on my half of this analysis of this episode on my channel, we talk about this guy. And I pointed out reasons why I believe that he has what I call a conspiracy theorist brain, where with little evidence or something happens, he just kind of runs with that because he gets excited at the thought of a different exciting narrative. And to, to the point where sometimes evidence takes the back seat. And I think we're certainly seeing that here to where the, the, the documentary maker presents something which I would consider a bit of a false equivalence, but this is your field. And he just jumps on that and goes, oh my God, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now he's going to run with that. So what I wanted, what I noted, but I want you to build on, in my opinion, just because something can happen doesn't mean that something for sure is happening. And that's the way it's being presented here. That because this sometimes happens, that is for sure what's happening here. Whereas I think, you know, there's, there's other ways to present that. What do you think? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I agree with what you said, Spidey. I like the way you use the term false equivalence because I'm not even sure if it's that accurate. You know, um, the, so the interviewer said that psychologists say the victims of this type of abuse, uh, well, I don't know if they say definitely not always, but commonly, typically become compulsive liars because they compartmentalize things. I don't think that's true, at least not a, not a high proportion. You know, as I said, I've, I've assessed hundreds of people from historic abuse cases and I see very, very clear patterns of behavior like taking drugs and alcohol, um, a, a long standing anxiety and depression, becoming promiscuous, um, having this intense anger, becoming quite self-destructive, self-harming. All of these things are commonly recognized that I've read in my textbook in all my uh, years of exam taking and training and there's things that I've seen personally in my assessments. I've never seen I that I can think of a compulsive liar because of that type of abuse. I have seen compulsive liars for other reasons, for like people that live in fantasy worlds, people that were neglected or isolated as children, people that had very strict parents, uh, you know, who, who literally had to create these kind of play worlds. All of these things predisposed to compulsive lying or there's a higher incidence of compulsive liars or uh, fantasy worlds, people living in fantasy worlds in those things, in those areas, but not from this type of abuse. So I don't, I don't agree that that's accurate in the first place. And even if it was accurate, like you say, um, just because something happens in a proportion of people that have an experience doesn't mean that it's definitely happening in this case. So I think to summarize, I think it's all a bit convenient from an angle from the can from the um, documentary makers to try and excuse some of Casey's behavior because we know that she has lied told some quite big lies and misled the police for example during their investigation and also um, you know leading the police to a uh, to where she su supposedly worked in Warner Studios did I get that right and she didn't even work there yeah Universal she never I mean she had worked there for a little bit but it had been years yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, those are my thoughts. What do you think? I'm exactly where you're at with this. And again, I, I love this guy. We see him confusing theory with, with, with arguable likelihood with fact. Like to him, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's definitely what's happening here. So, um, but yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and, and again, I, you know, maybe people who have 
been abused lie about details of that or conceal elements of that and don't go around talking about it and advertising it. But to say that that equates to someone who lies compulsively, again, as you said, even if true, doesn't mean we can go, oh, she's a compulsive liar, therefore she must have been abused. There, to me, there's zero bridge between those two thoughts. So it's almost like three different non-experts have come up with an expert opinion. You've got the non-expert of the documentary asking a psychologist that don't know what they're talking about, asking a guy who's prone to conspiracy theories to agree with them <laughs> through a leading question. That's what we've got. And that's how conspiracies start. Now this guy goes around saying, oh yeah, yeah, he for sure did it. Um, that that's why we need people like us, Spidey. Yeah. I could still report him for what he did to me. There's no statute of limitations in the state of Florida for what he did to me, to us. My main thing with this is, why aren't you? <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Like, why, why isn't she? So, I mean, the, the first thing, un unfortunately, in other cases similar to this, is that there might not be an evidence trail, given that it was such a long time ago. So if even if it was true, it might be really hard to prove it. And I suppose being the cynic, if it wasn't true, and I can't say that definitively, but if it wasn't true, then it seems kind of convenient that she might not want it to be investigated because she might not think it's something that, that she could win. But I suppose, you know, we have to be careful. We can't be, we can't just not believe her comments and her accusations about abuse because we know that she's lied about other things. Yeah, I'm just thinking like, why did she even say this? Like, oh, there's no such a limitation. I go after him. Like, why would you, why would you say that? Because like, don't say it. And we'll be like, okay, well, we don't know. But why would you say it and not do it? You know, don't you want justice for your daughter when you're telling us now that you very much suspect that he did something? Yeah. Um, don't you want justice for her? Don't you want justice for yourself? Like, you're, you're accusing him of such horrible things. Go, let's go, get it done. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You're going to ask that question. Not today. What do you think my question was going to be? What happened? It was written all over your face. And I'm telling you, I'm not ready to answer. After this morning, after that, I need to watch her funeral. I need to see what he says. Okay, first of all, super proud of Casey Anthony because that's some good mentalism right there. She like deduced the question she was about to be asked by a facial expression. That's incredible. That was an incredible bit of mentalism. That's bordering on uh, telepathy, isn't it? Dude, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think she's tele. She, I think she's telepathic. Um, but what just happened? So when she said you want to ask me what happened did she that day, what happened to her daughter? Like, yeah. what the big, the big question? What happened? Not so. Okay. No, that it's a. She's talking about that. She goes. You want? She comes back from. She had that breakdown that we looked at on my channel. Remember where she walked away. And then she comes back, she sits down and it's this. She goes, I know you want to ask me, but nope, not happening. Complete refusal to answer. Now refusal to answer is something we listen for a lot in interrogation. When we ask a question, one of the main things in our head is, did the answer provided answer the specific question? If it didn't, it's a red flag. It's meaningless alone. That's important for the viewers to know. You know, lie detection, there's, it's not, there's no such thing as lie detection. It's stress detection. We have to see a lot of different things to, you know, want to go a certain way, but we can never look at someone's answer and go, that's a lie with any amount of confidence. Just kind of guides us a little bit where to go and where we want to ask more questions, but refusal to answer a question is a really big one. And this wasn't even covert. This was an overt refusal to answer. Like, no, I'm not doing it until I see footage of the funeral. I what was this, do you think this was some sort of tactic from the Dr. Chick? Ooh, say this, it'll be nice and like it'll lead into the next scene. I don't know, I, I have no idea what's happening. I mean, my thoughts are that it is the ultimate question, isn't it? I mean, there's so many, there's so many uh, unknowns and mysterious parts of this case, but that what happened to Kaylee is the biggest question. It's the crux of the matter, of the whole investigation, of the whole documentary. So, by her not being willing to answer that question, and she must have thought about it a hundred times. Like, you know, either she knows what happens and she doesn't want to talk about it, which is a possibility, or she doesn't know what happened. But has, but has probably or should have been thinking about it incessantly for years. So it's weird that she's not willing to discuss it. Um, and then not today. What does that mean? Does that mean today was too stressful for her to want to think about what happened? But surely it's such a big deal that nothing should prevent her from at least 
being able to logically think through the possibilities. Yeah, it's very confusing. I think it's, I think the not today is like dramatization. Like, no, not today. You know, like she does these things every now and then where like, she'll repeat something, like she'll say something. So like for, when she was talking about her parents doing the documentary for money, for money. Like she like over dramatizes. And I think that's what it's not today. Like it's like, this, it's a movie line almost in my opinion. And, and, and there is drama to this. Like this, nope, I know you want to ask me, that's not happening, not today. I don't know, there was just something about this that to me felt, so. and like you said, like you said, shouldn't you be aching to answer that question? To get your narrative out there? Shouldn't that be your one and only goal here? To get justice for your daughter to talk about what happened? So it's almost like it's a calculated attempt to sidestep that question, but the best that she can do is wrap it up in so much kind of distress and sadness and grief and emotion that it feels... Uh, justifiable to to dodge the question good point yeah for us to go okay poor dear she's so okay. emotional we'll come back to it. yeah sorry okay <laughs> sorry for asking you a question that's the whole point of the documentary and so many of you that never got a chance to actually hug her smell her hair smell the sweet sweat when she came in from outside i miss that kiss on the cheek that special hug that I tell everyone it's so great to get a hug from someone, but to get a hug from a small child, that gives me energy like you couldn't imagine. That's not normal. Nothing about that is normal. You're outright telling the world that you're a child. Jesus Christ. So pretty direct question for you there, uh, Dr. Daz. Do you agree with her assessment of that? Right, so it is, it's very, very possible. We've said this countless times, both in this episode and previous episodes, that, that neither of us are going to de deny that she might be telling the truth and that she could, be, uh, uh, she could have been abused. We, we both acknowledge that. But just from this clip, from what she's been watching, that does not, to me, seem to have any hidden or camouflage message that her father is, has been abusive towards uh, Kaylee. Because what he said was to me just kind of a sweet memorial, you know, special hugs. The sweet smell of sweat is, is a slightly odd thing to say, but you know, in the context of a grieving grandfather who's clearly upset, in my in my mind, that's in no way, um, any way, a sexualized kind of comment at all. I think it's just a sweet thing that literally comes to his mind. Like he genuinely remembers that about Kaylee. That's why he said it for no other kind of reason or hidden agenda. So I don't see why she's got that from what he said. What do you think? Uh, I, I agree with you. And for me, it comes back to this concept of goggles and what goggles we're putting on. If you put goggles on me and you told me this man is for a fact an, an abuser, and I heard that speech, I'd go, oh, E. Wow. If you put on me the goggles that said, this is a grandfather grieving and missing his granddaughter, I would see nothing wrong with it. Now, that being said, I've been in situations before to where an abuser might say something and only the person who knows their true nature reacts because they themselves have the goggles that they know what this person is capable of and it affects them a different way than it affects me. Like, I don't see anything in that statement, but they're filtering it through something that they know. So, if true, if we give her the benefit of the doubt and it's true, she's got that filter that he's an abuser, I can maybe see how this would affect her differently than it would affect us. Yeah. Does, uh, uh, yeah. But the other thing is something you said in, in, in the other part of this analysis. If he is an abuser and he knows this is being filmed and he knows this is going to be scrutinized by the public, he would select his words very carefully as to not give her or anyone else ammunition to accuse him of something. He would choose his words a lot carefully. Here I see, personally, a man who is speaking freely without applying a filter of, oh, could that be misconstrued as something creepy? He's just speaking his piece. Yeah, it's a little weird, some of the things he's saying, but I don't think he's thinking about that. Yeah. It doesn't feel in any way kind of calculated. It feels like pure reaction, pure emotion. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I see exactly what you're saying. But again, I'm not going to invalidate that to her. It can mean something different than it means to us. I have one job to keep her safe. As a parent, that's your most important job is to keep your kids safe. If you're honest with yourself, Casey, did you do everything in your power to protect your daughter? 
I thought I did. I tried. So once again, for me going back to what I said earlier, right there at the end, that's a non-answer statement or a refusal to answer the question. The question is verbatim, did you do everything you can? And she says, I, I thought I did, I tried. That's not an answer. The answer is, is no. And, and this is where, again, inconsistency and consistency and consistency. She is admitting here that her one job was to protect her daughter. And she's being asked, did you do that? And, and she knows in that answer, in that very dodgy answer, she knows that in her own narrative, she alleges that she left her daughter with this man for a whole month. This man that there's fluctuating memories because there are times where she says only in jail did she remember what he had done. There's times where she says she used to not let him alone with Kaylee because she knew what he's capable of. So that doesn't really work. But it comes down to the fact that she left her with him allegedly for a month. So if your job is to protect her, why did you do that? What do you think? So I think there's no circumstance or no scenario, no narrative where the answer clearly isn't that she didn't protect Kaylee. So Casey has got different versions of events that she said at different times during her trial, during this documentary, during police interviews. <clears throat> there's a theory, and I, you know, I can't say this with absolute certainty, but there's a theory that she knew from the beginning that her that her daughter was missing, and that's you know partly related to why she seemed to be in such relief and partying for those 31 days. But whatever happened, whether she knew that her daughter was missing, whether her father took her daughter's limp body away and Casey didn't know at that point whether she was safe or alive or not, whether she thought that Kaylee was with her father for that entire period of time and was in this huge fear of her father and was lying to the police to try and mislead them away from the real perpetrator who's her father. doesn't matter which one of those narratives you pick, her, she didn't do the best to protect her daughter in any of them, you know? So she knows that. There's no way she could not have known that. So she is just trying to sidestep something. We just don't know definitively what that something is. But whatever it is, she's implicit in some ways into what's been going on. So, yeah, so I can't think of a nicer way than to say that she is, no matter what the truth is, she's lied in response to that question. Dr. Daz, I think that's one of the best points anyone's ever made about this entire case, is that there's no version of this where she's not a neglectful parent. There's no version of it. And, and, and that explains why, as a narcissist, she can't answer that question. Because she, she can't turn on herself and say, no, I was a bad parent. This is, this is why you're the Dr. Daz. <laughs> this is why we're spy das. Spy, spy das, no. No. Uh -uh. What was no. the one you said? That's Spidey. <laughs> okay, that's even worse. Okay, let's we'll, we'll continue workshopping. Let us know in the comment section, viewers, what uh, our collaboration should be called from now on. It's bad enough I had to imagine that it happened once, but then to imagine that it could have kept happening. Did he take her away to abuse her? That's the darkest question, isn't it? I've always wanted the truth because I've lived so long without it. But I don't know if I can handle all of it. I don't know if it would be better to know or just keep not knowing. Because I don't know what the truth is. All I know is that she's dead. That something happened. So I suppose when I think about that, she's claiming that she wants to know the truth, but her behavior, not just once, but on several separate instances, has indicated that she's tried to obfuscate the truth. She's tried to hinder investigation. So we know that she specifically misled the police. What we mentioned before about lying to them where she worked, then she created this nanny character that didn't exist that we found out later on. We know that there's been phone calls with the parents, and I think prison visits with the parents where she's been at best indifferent and at times slightly passively aggressively um, complaining about the investigations and the efforts that have been put uh, that were being made to find her daughter Kaylee and um, what else she has changed her story so her legal team pushed this narrative of it, of it being an accident and then later on 
after the fact, quite disrespectfully to her legal team. Casey has completely changed uh, her version of events. Um, she's do- even in this video that we've talked about, she's been dodging questions. The biggest one that jumps to my mind is when the interviewer asked, well, actually she, preom- she preempted the interviewer wanting to ask her what had happened to Kaylee and just said she didn't want to talk about it, which as we've said, seems to be the crux of the entire point of the documentary. So her behavior seems very... Um, oppositional to somebody that wants to know the truth so yeah those are my immediate thoughts what about yourself spidey what do you think we've talked about leading questions before you and i and um there's another one here where the uh documentary maker says uh you know that that's the worst part isn't it to imagine what he would have what he would have done to her i don't i personally think an interview especially in documentary when trying to get the truth you're not supposed to add elements like that ask the question let her say that but for you to add that element and try to like provoke her like that, I, I don't know, I find that a little strange. I don't know if you agree with that. Yeah, I didn't, I have to admit, I didn't even pick up on that, but it's a very good point, yeah. But but you, you remember that she said that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's strange, like she's adding this poking, probing, probing element. Um, finally, yeah, I, 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 I paid quite a bit of attention to what you said, and I went a little bit of a different way with it, because yes, if, if we focus on her saying, you know, I want to know, you're absolutely right. But there's, what, what, what stood out to me was this element of she's not sure if she wants to know, right? She goes, I don't know. I don't know if I can handle the truth. And if that's all it was, I don't know if I can handle the truth. I'd be like, okay, that makes sense to me. You know, you don't know if you can emotionally handle the truth. But to go on to say, I don't know if I would be better, um, it would be better to know or go on not knowing. The main reason I took note of this uncertainty is relates to a clip we're about to look at that's coming up. So just keep in mind, pin that, that she said, I don't know. I don't know if I'd be be it would be better to know or go on not knowing. I'm not sure. I don't know. So keep that in mind. Because nothing's going to bring her back. Nothing. Even if I someday get the answers that I need, it's never going to be enough. No. It's never going to be enough. There it is. Yeah, I know exactly what you're about to say. Go for it. No, you go for it. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad we <laughs> agree. Go for it. I hadn't picked this. Uh, so I've, I've watched these clips briefly before uh, before this recording, and I hadn't picked up on it then. But now there is a contradiction between her saying she's unsure if she wants to know, and then this clip saying that she definitely does need, well, that. She needs need. to know the answers, but need. but it yeah need to know the answers, but it won't make a difference of bringing Kaylee back. So yeah, there's a there's a definite discrepancy there, isn't there? Yeah, and it goes right back to what you were saying before with full confidence. If you need to know these answers, what what were you doing for a month? You know, if you need to know these answers, why are you not right now? Why are you so much on the defensive? There's certain things that for me it bothers me that she's on the defensive, like that Google search. So for those of you who don't know, there was a Google search from the home that that day where, where Kaylee went missing, there was a search on the computer for foolproof suffocation. Now, she alleges that wasn't her search. But if it wasn't her search, why isn't she aggressively going like, somebody searched suffocation. Guys, it was my dad. Let's go. You know, you're saying you need to know answers, but then you're saying you don't know if you can handle the answers, and you're not really doing that much to go after these answers. And ultimately... This was always my problem with OJ as well. This is the, the thing that's always been a problem for me with OJ and Casey Anthony. It's fine, you're alleging you're innocent and you're getting off the hook, but why don't you care more about what happened to your ex-wife or your daughter? And it's hard to for that answer logically not to be because you already know what happened. I mean, that is, that's the logical, Occam's razor, that's the simplest logical, most, uh, most logical answer, isn't it? Exactly.